If you ever thought about starting your own podcast, you should check out Riverside. Riverside is an online recording studio that lets you record podcasts and video in studio quality from anywhere. And if you click on the affiliated link in the episode description and you buy a subscription, you will also be supporting the podcast. And if you are going to start your own podcast or you just want to continue to listen to great podcasts, you're going to need headphones or speakers. If you click on the Amazon affiliated link, you can get great deals on headphones and speakers. And if you make a purchase, it will also help support the podcast. And if you ever want to read a book I have mentioned on this podcast, I now have an affiliated link for Bookshop. All the affiliated links that I mentioned will be in the episode description for this episode. I just wanted to remind you that this podcast has merch and this podcast is also on Patreon and there's some perks that come along with joining the Patreon. I will leave the links to both of those things in the show notes. I am a firm believer that anyone, no matter who they are, has the ability to affect change. Sure, those in a position of power, or even those adjacent to power, have the ability to make the most change, but far too often do we see those with power are the ones that are doing the least to make change happen, especially for the good. But that is not the story of today's episode. Hi, my name is Courtney Jewell, and you are listening to the 20th episode of the fourth season of History Show, a podcast about history that proves that sometimes fact is even more interesting than fiction. We are in season four of History Shelf, and it is titled They Are a Rainbow. This season of History Shelf, I will be covering each week a historical figure that was a part of the LGBTQIA community. These were people that during their time, they had to hide a part of their identity from the world. So while I fully believe that those who were out and proud in their lifetime, even if it had the potential to cost them everything, deserve to be praised and recognized, those are not the people that I will be covering this season. I am covering the ones that were made to love in the shadows. The ones that had to lie to most or all of the people around them. Now, I know that sexual orientation and gender identity are complex, and some of the terms that I will use to describe these subjects were not around in some of their lifetimes, so some of these subjects obviously would not have used the same words to describe themselves as I will be using, but I don't want to get too hung up on my wording. I just want to celebrate a part of these individuals that in their time there was pressure all around them to feel shame about. I want to focus on that love and gender are not black and white. They are a rainbow. And for this week, I am talking about Eleanor Roosevelt once again. This is Eleanor Roosevelt Part 2. That means that there was an Eleanor Roosevelt Part 1. That was last week's episode. If you haven't already, I recommend that you listen to that episode first. That way you understand what's going on a little bit better and who everyone is. But if you want to listen to this episode first, that's okay too. If you need a little refresher on what happened in last week's episode, I've got a recap for you. Here it is. Eleanor Roosevelt was born into a well-to-do family. She was the niece of the U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. She was orphaned before she reached adulthood. She married her fifth cousin, once removed, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin had an affair with Eleanor's secretary, Lucy Mercer. That changed their marriage from then on out. Their marriage was more like a political partnership. Eleanor fell in love with the reporter, Lorena Hickok. She may have also fell in love with Harry Hopkins and her bodyguard, Earl Miller. Franklin became the 32nd President of the United States, and that is where we left off last week's episode. And I said last week that I would start this episode with telling you how Eleanor was as a first lady. And that's what I'm going to do right now. 
When Franklin became president, Eleanor wasn't really thrilled. She didn't like the idea of being the first lady. She knew what the job entailed. She knew all of the 20th century first ladies. So that means that she would have known Rose Cleveland. If you remember, I already covered Rose Cleveland this season. Eleanor knew that being the first lady, your job was to be a good hostess. That just wasn't her. So Eleanor hated the role of first lady for all of the reasons Rose Cleveland hated it. The wolfhour life just wasn't for Eleanor. Eleanor was determined to redefine what the role of first lady looked like. She told the country that she would not be the typical first lady when she arrived at the White House. She told them that she would not be a symbol of elegance. She was going to instead just be plain ordinary Mrs. Roosevelt. She held a press conference when she first became first lady. She was the first first lady to do that. At this press conference, there were only female reporters that were allowed to attend. She did that because female reporters were usually banned from presidential press conferences. Eleanor holding a press conference would not just be a one-time thing. She would hold regular press conferences, and she would do it with female reporters. She saw the playbook on how to be a first lady, and she tossed it out. She was unapologetically herself. When Eleanor moved into the White House, she signed a contract with the magazine Women's Home Companion. She wrote a monthly column for them. In that column, she answered readers' questions. That column was canceled in 1936 because there was another election coming up. In May of 1933, America was suffering through the Great Depression. Thousands of World War I veterans marched on Washington. This was the second time they had marched in two years. The veterans wanted their bonuses. Franklin's Economy Act had reduced the benefits that they were already receiving. The last time the what was called the Bonus Army had marched on Washington, President Herbert Hoover used force to get rid of the marchers. It is known as one of the most disturbing moments in Washington's history. This event had an impact on Eleanor. She never wanted anything like that to ever happen again. Franklin sent his advisor, Lewis Howe, to meet with the Bonus Army's leaders. They gave them a clean campsite and three meals each day. Franklin offered the marchers a spot in the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was a public works job program. To help seal this deal, they sent in Eleanor. On May 16th, 1933, Lewis asked Eleanor to take him for a drive. On the drive, Lewis told Eleanor that they needed her to meet with the marchers without her secret service. Eleanor was fine with this. She actually liked interacting with the public without her handlers. Eleanor talked with the marchers and sang army songs with them. Eleanor waded through mud as she toured the camp. She gave them an impromptu speech she told them that during the war, she volunteered to drive a truck into the railroad yards at night and served sandwiches and coffee to soldiers before they shipped out. She also told them how she had been moved by seeing wounded soldiers. She told them that she never wanted to see another war again. The veterans walked back to her car with her and waved to her as she drove off. By June, about 2,600 veterans had accepted the Civilian Conservation Corps jobs, and in 1936, Congress passed a bill overriding Franklin's veto and authorizing early payment of the veterans' benefits. Eleanor fought for civil rights. 
and it all started with Arthur Dale, West Virginia. Lorena, remember that was the reporter that Eleanor was in love with, urged Eleanor to visit families of homeless minors in Morgantown, West Virginia. On August 18, 1933, Eleanor did just that. Eleanor was extremely affected by the miners' struggle. She wanted a resettlement community for them. This community was Arthurdale. This was a place where they could make a living by farming, handicrafts, and a local manufacturing plant. Franklin backed this community. It had a rocky start, but then things got better. Eleanor raised money for this community for several years. She even used some of her own money for the project. How this sparked her getting involved in the civil rights movement was she wanted Arthurdale to be a racially mixed community, but the miners only wanted white Christians. So Eleanor recommended other communities for the black and Jewish miners, and then from there on out, Eleanor started speaking out against racial injustice and discrimination. Both Republicans and Democrats were against Arthurdale. Republicans screamed it was socialism and a communist plot. Democrats opposed government competition with private enterprise. It was generally seen as a failure, but the residents saw it as utopia, and Eleanor saw it as a success. She said, quote, I don't know whether you think that it is worth half a million dollars, but I do, end quote. The Gridiron Club is a selective journalistic organization in Washington, D.C. They host an annual dinner called Gridiron Club Dinner. It is off the record. The president attends. There are satirical musical skits done by club members and representatives in both of the two major political parties. These dinners were an all-boys club. So, women reporters were not allowed to attend. So, Eleanor hosted what she called Gridiron Widows. This event was for the wives of the men that attended the Gridiron Dinners. So, Eleanor started holding the Gridiron Widows in 1933. And it was really just a protest, or at least that is what it started as. But by 1935, the Gridiron Widows was a full-blown imitation of the Gridiron Dinner. Eleanor became very popular in 1935. There was a new hybrid rose named Mrs. Franklin G. Roosevelt. In 1934, there was another resettlement community that was established in West Virginia as a part of the New Deal. Even though this town was a sundown town, a sundown town was a whites-only town, and Eleanor spoke out for African-American rights, this town was called Eleanor, West Virginia. African-American rights wasn't the only rights that Eleanor fought for. American Youth Congress was formed in 1935, and they advocated for youth rights. Eleanor formed a close relationship with the American Youth Congress. That relationship led to the National Youth Administration that was a part of a New Deal agency. In 1934, Eleanor had set up a meeting with Franklin and NAWACP leader Walter White to discuss anti-lynching legislation. This wasn't the only time that she spoke out for civil rights. In fact, her stance on the civil rights movement was one of the reasons why J. Edgar Hoover did not like Eleanor. Remember, I mentioned that in last week's episode. Eleanor also spoke out for her fellow woman. She got women involved in politics. She arranged a meeting with Franklin, James Farley. He was the head of the Democratic National Committee, and Molly Dusen in 1935. Molly was the head of the women's division of the DNC. And they discussed the role of women in political elections. Eleanor then began publishing the syndicated column, My Day, 
This column ran six days a week from December 31st, 1935 to September 26th, 1962. In this column, Eleanor discussed things that mattered most to her. She talked about civil rights, women's rights, and current events. Current events like the New Deal programs, World War II, the H-bomb, Pearl Harbor, Prohibition, and the civil rights movement. This was the first time a first lady wrote in a daily newspaper. When Eleanor heard about the National Training School for Girls, a predominantly black reform school that was in terrible condition, she wrote about it in her column, My Day. And she lobbied for additional funding and she pushed for changes in staff and in the curriculum. She also wrote for Ladies Home Journal, McCall's, and Vogue. You can now buy a collection of Eleanor's best writings. I will put it on my list of books for Eleanor Roosevelt on Bookshop in case you want to buy a copy. She also hosted a weekly radio show, another first for a first lady. Eleanor became the most controversial first lady in history. One of the things that I love about Eleanor is she wasn't afraid to be a little mischievous. In November of 1939, America was going through the Red Scare which that was when many were afraid that people in America may be communists. The House Un-American Activities Committee subpoenaed members of the American Youth Congress. They wanted to know if they had ties to the Communist Party. Eleanor heard about this, and so she asked Franklin if she could show up unannounced. He said she could. The members hadn't testified by noontime, so Eleanor invited them to the White House for lunch. The college students had nowhere to sleep for the night, so Eleanor let all ten of them sleep at the White House. It is the people's house, after all. The students got to chat and dine with the President of the United States. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow a singer named Marian Anderson to perform in their auditorium. Why? Because she was African American. When Eleanor heard about this, she resigned her membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution. Not only did she resign her membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution, but she also had the singer Marian Anderson sing at the Lincoln Memorial on Easter Sunday. Eleanor continued to be a rebel with a cause when she sat between the white and black section at the Southern Conference for Human Welfare in Birmingham, Alabama. During the first years of Franklin's presidency, Eleanor made a lot of money from her lectures. She made $75,000 a year but she gave most of her money to charity. Throughout Franklin's presidency, Eleanor traveled all around the country. She would visit relief projects and survey working in living conditions. She would then bring her findings back to Franklin. She was known as the president's eyes, ears, and legs. On July 17, 1940, Franklin was running for a third term as president. This was before presidents could only serve two terms. On July 17, 1940, Eleanor made an impromptu speech at the Democratic National Convention. She was the first first lady to speak at a party convention. Her speech helped Franklin win a third term. Even though Eleanor was doing a lot, not everyone thought that Eleanor was doing everything that she could. Arthur Zurinell Hurston criticized Eleanor when Marian Anderson 
remember that was the singer that wanted to sing at the Daughter of the American Revolution's auditorium. He was denied by the Board of Education to sing at an auditorium of an all-white high school, and Eleanor did not challenge that decision, and Zora Neale Hurston criticized Eleanor for not challenging it. Even though Eleanor did arrange a concert for Marion on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, like I said earlier, and she also presented her to the King and Queen of the United Kingdom. Eleanor also appointed Mary McLeod Bethune as director of the Division of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration. When Mary would visit the White House, Eleanor would meet Mary at the gate and she would walk with her arm in arm so there would be no problem with Mary entering. On May 10th, 1940, Germany invaded Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Before this, World War II had been relatively conflict-free. Eleanor wanted to travel to Europe to help out with the Red Cross, but that could have turned badly. Eleanor could have become a prisoner of war, and that would have been disastrous to have a first lady become a prisoner of war. So she was advised against it. She did work on allowing European refugee children to immigrate to the United States, and she lobbied Franklin to allow more people from groups that were being persecuted by the Nazis to immigrate to the United States. Franklin, instead of expanding it, he restricted it. That is one of the things that I love about Eleanor. She wasn't afraid to stand up to her husband and speak her mind, even when they disagreed. And this was a time when women were supposed to be good, quiet housewives. Because of Eleanor, the U.S. accepted 83 Jewish refugees. Eleanor's son, James, said that Eleanor's biggest regret was that she did not force Franklin to accept more refugees. In 1941, Eleanor co-chaired the Office of Civilian Defense, but she was forced to resign because the House of Representatives were angry over the high salaries for many of the Office of Civilian Defense appointments. This included two close friends of Eleanor's. She also wrote and released a short film. This film was titled Women in Defense. The film stated all the ways that women could help the country in case the U.S. went to war. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. What happened next was one of the most shameful and atrocious moments in U.S. history. Franklin ordered internment camps for Japanese Americans to be built. This order was known as Executive Order 9066. From 1942 to 1945, this was the policy of the U.S. government. So, what were internment camps? They were camps where people of Japanese descent were incarcerated. What were their crimes? They were Japanese. People with Japanese ancestry were forced out of their homes and into these camps. About 120,000 people were forced into these camps and America caused a domino effect. Canada and Mexico copied the U.S., Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina sent 2,264 people of Japanese descent to America. The targeting of Japanese people started just hours after Pearl Harbor was bombed. 1,291 Japanese American community and religious leaders were arrested by the FBI without evidence and they had their assets frozen. The next month, they were transferred to prison camps in Montana, New Mexico, and North Dakota. Thousands of Japanese Americans 
had their homes searched. Politicians were calling for mass incarceration of Japanese Americans. Japanese owned fishing boats were impounded. When Japanese Americans were being rounded up, they had a six day notice to get rid of their belongings other than what they could carry. Anyone that was at least one sixteenth Japanese was rounded up. This included children, the elderly, and the disabled. These people were first sent to what was called assembly centers. Then they were transported to a relocation center and then to a permanent wartime residence. At the assembly centers, prisoners were offered some work and some were able to leave to attend college classes. The prison camps called relocation centers were like their own town. They had their own farms, schools, post offices, and work facilities. Though each town was surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers. There was violence in these prison camps. First, the people forced into these camps had to march two miles after they got off the trains to get to the prison camps. On July 27th, 1942, two men named Toshio Kubota and Hirota Isumura were shot and killed. The guard claimed that he did it because they were trying to escape, but other Japanese Americans said they were just struggling to march because both of the elderly men were disabled. The guard was found not guilty, of course, but Personally, as a general rule, I'm going to believe the oppressed instead of the oppressor. And even if they were trying to escape, who the hell would blame them? They did nothing wrong. On August 4th, 1942, there was a riot that broke out at an assembly center as a result of anger about insufficient rations and overcrowding. A man named Fred Tayoma was beaten. Police tear gassed crowds because they feared a riot. The crowd was at the police station because they were demanding the release of Harry Wena. He had been arrested for allegedly assaulting Fred. James Ito was killed and many others were wounded. Jim Kamagawa, a 21-year-old man, was wounded and he died from his wounds five days later. At another relocation center, 63-year-old prisoner James Hudski was shot and killed because he was walking near the fence. Two months later, a couple would also be shot for walking near the fence. In another center, there were strikes to protest food shortages and unsafe conditions that led to accidental deaths. At that same camp, 30-year-old James Okamoto was shot and killed by a guard. The prison camps ended in 1945 following the Supreme Court's decision. The last Japanese internment camp was closed in March of 1946. In 1976, President Gerald Ford officially repealed Executive Order 9066. In 1988, Congress issued a formal apology and passed the Civil Liberties Act awarding $20,000 each to over 80,000 Japanese Americans as reparations. That is $52,492.77 in today's money. Eleanor spoke out against Japanese American prejudice even when her husband was putting them in internment camps. She never supported the internment camps and she took a lot of heat for supporting Japanese Americans. The Los Angeles Times even said that she should be forced to retire from public life over her support. Odell Waller shot and killed Oscar Davis on July 15, 1940. Odell was black and Oscar was white. Oscar was Odell's landlord. No one is for sure what happened between the two of them. Odell said that he shot Oscar in self-defense. A black teenage employee of Oscar's, Henry Davis, said that Odell shot Oscar without being provoked or without a warning. 
One of Oscar's sons said that before Oscar died, he told him that it was not self-defense. Odell's relatives that were with him were too far away to hear their conversation, so their testimonies were inconclusive. Odell was found guilty by an all-white jury, and he was sentenced to death. Many believed that Odell did not get a fair trial. You are probably wondering why I am telling you this story on an episode about Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, Eleanor was one of the people that were speaking out for Odell. She wrote to the governor of Virginia, Governor James H. Price. She asked him to look in and see if Odell did get a fair trial. This pissed off some people, and by people, I do mean white Southerners. The governor stayed Odell's execution for three months. Odell was denied an appeal by the U.S. Supreme Court twice. Activists became desperate to save Odell. Eleanor used her connection as the wife of the president to get him to write to the governor of Virginia. Now the governor of Virginia was Colgate Darden. Franklin did write to Colgate to commute Odell's sentence to life imprisonment. Franklin signed the letter, quote, an old friend who just happens to be president, end quote. Colgate held a 10-hour clemency meeting. He decided to let the execution happen. Odell was executed by the electric chair on the morning of July 2nd, 1942. He was 25 years old. Because of Eleanor's support of African American rights, there were rumors that people started Eleanor Clubs. Eleanor Clubs were supposedly formed by servants that opposed their employers. And there were rumored Eleanor Tuesdays, where African American men would knock down white women on the street. But there's no actual evidence of Eleanor Clubs or Eleanor Tuesdays ever existing. Not only was Eleanor brave enough to speak out and use her power to help people that were in America, but she also eventually did go overseas to visit the troops. In October of 1942, she toured England. In August of 1943, Eleanor visited American troops in the South Pacific. She traveled to Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, and South Pacific. In just five weeks, she traveled 25,000 miles. That is about the distance equal to the Earth's circumference. She first went to Christmas Island in Australia. There she slept on army cots and rustic huts, traveled by jeep over rough terrain to get to isolated camps, and she made her way on foot through the jungle. She spoke with soldiers and she got up at dawn so she could eat breakfast with them. She walked for miles so she could get to hospitals so she could bring comfort to the wounded. Her presence there boosted morale. Admiral William Halsey Jr. said that Eleanor, quote, alone accomplished more good than any other person or any group of civilians who had passed through my area, end quote. Eleanor was deeply affected by what she witnessed war could do. She became an advocate of peace. Not everyone was pleased with Eleanor going to visit the troops. Congressional Republicans criticized her for going. They criticized her for using wartime resources for her trip. Franklin, in response, suggested that she push pause on her traveling. Eleanor was a big supporter of the Tuskegee Airmen. Who were the Tuskegee Airmen and why were they so special? Before I answer that, I need to talk about what was going on in America during this time. When the Tuskegee Airmen came to be, it was a time in America when segregation was still a thing. There were still Jim Crow laws. This limited African Americans in a lot of ways. One of the ways they were limited was in the military. Before the Tuskegee Airmen, African Americans in the military were limited to kitchen work or motor pool. That changed on April 3rd, 1939. On April 3rd, 1939, Franklin approved Public Law 18. This provided for an expansion of the Army Air Corps. This law called for the creation of training programs to be located at black colleges. On January 16th, 1941, the War Department announced 
the creation of the 99th Pursuit Squadron. The Pursuit Squadron was an all-black flying unit trained at the Tuskegee Institute. Like I said earlier, Eleanor was a big supporter of the Tuskegee Airmen. In 1941, she visited the Tuskegee Army Airfield. When she was there, she asked to take a flight with one of the pilots. This idea made the Secret Service very anxious, but Eleanor did it anyway. The pilot that gave her a ride was Chief Civilian Flight Instructor Charles Alfred Anderson. He is known today as the father of black aviation. Eleanor and Charles flew over Alabama for over an hour. This was just another example of how she stood up for the civil rights movement. She had taken public heat from a lot of people for her support of the civil rights movement, but she continued to show up for the cause. Press coverage of her visit helped advocate for the competency of these pilots and boosted the visibility of the Institute. After her visit, Eleanor maintained a long-term correspondence with some of the airmen. Even though I have been telling you all about the things Eleanor was able to accomplish and all the good she was able to do, you can still see how there were times when she was restricted. She often used her power as first lady to try and make change, but she wasn't the president. Sure, she tried to push her husband to make changes that she wanted, and sometimes that worked, but sometimes it did not. E.H. Crump was the Democratic boss of Memphis in 1943. He drove two black Republicans out of town. Their names were J.B. Martin and Robert Church Jr. This caught the attention of African-American labor leader A. Philip Randolph. I'm just going to call him Philip. He launched a personal campaign for free speech in Memphis. When he showed up in Memphis, E.H. Crump denied him venues and threatened local leaders with jail so they would not invite Philip to speak. Philip contacted Eleanor to get her to help. E.H. Crump, though, was a close friend of Franklin. This was her reply to Philip on December 18, 1943, quote, I referred your letter to a friend of mine when I received it, and I am sorry it has not been answered before. I was advised not to do anything as it might do more harm than good, end quote. Now, was she really advised not to get involved? Did she really believe that she would cause more harm than good? Or did she simply not want to make an enemy out of her husband's friend and ally? I don't know. In 1943, there was a housing project in Detroit, Michigan. The project was called the Sojourner Truth Housing Project. It was originally meant for African Americans, but some white people got a little butthurt and threw a fit. This caused the government to give the Sojourner Truth Housing Project to white people. The African Americans in the area where this housing project was knew that Eleanor spoke up for civil rights. And so they wrote to her and asked her to do something. She did do something. She criticized the government's move. She encouraged officials to reverse the decision. This caused many people and organizations to push for the housing project to be returned to the African American community. It was, but it was a fight. The National Workers League, which was an organization like the KKK, started a riot among the Polish Americans living in the neighborhood and the African Americans moving into the housing project. Two leaders of the National Workers League were indicted for starting the riot, but of course, they were never brought to trial. When the black families started moving into the housing units, they had to do so under military protection. Eleanor wanted Franklin to speak up about the racial divide in the country. He did not. <laughs> I will tell you, 
the wrong Roosevelt was elected president when Franklin was elected. As the year went on, racial tension got worse across the country. It was at a boiling point by the summer of 1943. Racial tension was the worst in Detroit, Michigan. It was an integral site for war production, so thousands of people moved to Detroit for the manufacturing jobs. A lot of those people came from the South. NAACP activist Walter White warned people in Detroit that a race riot could break out at any moment. He was right. A bloody riot broke out on June 20th, 1943 on Bell Island. It traveled inland and it did not end until the next night. Federal troops had to break up the riot. 34 people were killed. Nine of them were white and 25 of them were African Americans. 17 people were killed by police. All 17 of them were African Americans. 675 people were injured and the total in damages came to $2 million. Many blamed Eleanor for the riot. A Jackson, Mississippi newspaper wrote this, quote, Blood on her hands. It is blood on your hands, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. More than any other person, you are morally responsible for those race riots in Detroit, where two dozen were killed and fully 500 were injured in nearly a solid day of street fighting. You have been personally proclaiming and practicing social equality at the White House and wherever you go, Mrs. Roosevelt. In Detroit, a city noted for the growing imprudence and insolence of its Negro population, an attempt was made to put your preachments into practice, Mrs. Roosevelt. What followed is now history. Blood on your hands, Mrs. Roosevelt, and the damned spots won't wash out either. End quote. The writer of that article was not alone in their thinking. Many wrote to Eleanor blaming her for the riot. This is what a Georgia man wrote to Eleanor, quote, I feel you unwittingly doing the Negro race a great wrong with your ill-timed and ill-advised social reforms. The Northern Negro takes you seriously and there will be no end to trouble in the North. The Southern Negro knows you've got a lot to learn, but even so, it makes him dissatisfied and a poorer worker. As the enclosed article stated, the Negro will always pay the price." End quote. Many others sent Eleanor more racist bullshit that I'm not going to read because I'm sure you get the picture. Eleanor was heartbroken over the race riots. In her column, My Day, she wrote on June 22, 1943, quote, The domestic scene is anything but encouraging. We do not seem to have learned self-control and obedience to law yet, end quote. There was another race riot that broke out in July of that year. Eleanor then wrote this, quote, I was sick at heart over race riots which put us on par with Nazism, which we fight and make one tremble for what human beings may do when they no longer think but let themselves be dominated by their worst emotions, end quote. While Franklin refused to address the issue of race tensions and inequality, he did voice his opinions on the rioters, and he blamed them for the destruction. But again, he didn't address what led to said destruction. Polly Murray, an American civil rights activist, denounced Franklin for blaming the rioters but not addressing the cause. Eleanor and Polly were friends, but Eleanor understood why Polly denounced Franklin. In fact, Eleanor's exact words were, quote, I am sorry, but I understand, end quote. Eleanor did talk about the blame she received for the race riots. She said, quote, the stopping of false rumors and promotion of goodwill would go far towards the avoidance of such uprisings, end quote. The NAACP activist Walter White 
had Eleanor's back. He wrote this in a letter, quote, You're carrying your share and often far more than your share. Gives us faith that someday, somewhere, we too shall not be shut out of enjoyment of the fruits of our toil. And that we too may taste the privileges as well as the burdens of democracy. You have thus helped us to escape complete despair, and we are grateful. End quote. There were many people crying for Eleanor to stop speaking for civil rights. So, what do you think Eleanor did? Do you think she became silent? Nope. She continued, and she got even louder. On July 24th, 1943, Eleanor gave a speech in New York, and it has been called the frankest discussion of the race question ever made by the wife of a president. In this speech, Eleanor called for economic opportunity and equality of expression for Black Americans. Eleanor even showed her support for interracial marriage. She basically said that the law had no business in telling people who they could marry. She was way ahead of her time in thinking this way. Now, let me remind you that Eleanor gave this speech on July 24th, 1943. Interracial marriage would not become legal in the United States until June 12, 1967, when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mildred and Richard Loving, which I might do a future episode on one of the Lovings. It's a really interesting story. In 1945, Eleanor influenced Army Nurse Corps to open its membership to black women. Eleanor also joined the NAACP Board of Directors. On April 12, 1945, Franklin died of a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 63 years old. Eleanor learned that his mistress, Lucy Mercer, though now her name was Lucy Rutherford, had been with him when he died. Remember Lucy? She showed up in last week's episode. She was once Eleanor's secretary. She was Franklin's first affair. That was the affair that changed Eleanor and Franklin's marriage. Lucy was the one Franklin vowed to Eleanor that he would never see again. Well, the bastard lied. He continued on with his affair, and what made it even worse for Eleanor is when she found out that Franklin had continued to see Lucy, she found out that her daughter Anna knew about it and had been keeping it from her. And that's where I'm stopping this episode. Next week, I will tell you about Eleanor's life after Franklin died. Thank you so much for listening to the 20th episode of the fourth season of History Show. I'm covering 15 people this season. Next week's episode is going to be Eleanor Roosevelt, part three. I hope you come back for that. A few things before we go. If you want to follow this podcast on social media, the TikTok is at History Shelf. The Instagram is at History underscore Shelf underscore Pod. The Twitter slash X is History Shelf Pod. And the Facebook page is History Shelf Podcast. If you want to help out this podcast financially, there are a few ways you can do that. One is you can buy merch from the History Shelf Merch Store. Or you can become a Patreon. This podcast is always going to be free, but there are some perks that come along with becoming a Patreon. The first tier is called History Students, and that is $1 a month. And with that, I will give you a shout out on all social media platforms that History Shelf is on. I will also choose one Patreon at random for each episode I do. And at the end of the episode, I will give that Patreon a shout out. The second tier is called History Fan, and that is... $3 a month, and with that, you get the first tier, plus you get to vote in a poll that helps me choose the theme for the next season of this podcast. The third tier is called History Buff, and that is $20 a month, and with that, you get the first two tiers, plus you will get a handwritten note of thanks mail to you from me, and the last tier is called History Lover, and that is $40 a month, and with that, you get the first three tiers, plus you get to choose one item from the History Chef merch store. You can choose any item that you want, except for the zip-up hoodie. You can also take out ad space, 
on this podcast I have a gig on Fiverr that lets you do that also if you click on one of the affiliated links and you buy something that helps support the podcast there's one for Riverside one for Amazon and there's one for Bookshop but if you don't want any of the merch and you don't want any of the perks and you don't want to buy anything but you still want to help support the podcast I have turned on listener support on Spotify for podcasters the links to everything that I just mentioned will be in the show notes But as always, the best way that you can help support this podcast is to just to continue to listen to it. And there are a few other ways you can help out this podcast for free. One is if you are listening on a platform that lets you rate this podcast five stars and or leave a positive review, that would be very helpful. Also, sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family would be very helpful. All right. Well, until next time, keep learning, keep loving history, and come back for next week's episode.